This is the word of the Lord from 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. This is God's word. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is the word of the Lord. So men, will you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, our desire is that you would be glorified tonight, tomorrow, throughout all of our lives, throughout all generations, forever and ever, through us, through the church, and through Christ Jesus. Hallowed be your name. May you glorify yourself now as we open your word and seek to be trained and equipped to act like men who are disciplined. Please equip us, train us, sanctify us in the truth. Your word is truth. Give us today our daily bread from the scriptures. Give us this spiritual bread that we need to be strengthened so that we can glorify you and enjoy you as you've created us to do. We thank you for Christ Jesus. We thank you that you sent your only son into the world to save miserable sinners like me and like these men and these boys here. We thank you for your mercy in Christ. We ask you to pour out your Spirit on us as we study your Word. Help us to understand what you're saying here through Paul. Help us to apply it to our lives, and help us to be changed so that we'd never be the same. But we would say along with Paul, I buffet my body and make it my slave for your glory, our joy, for the good of our neighbors, the good of our families, and the good of your world. Equip us, sanctify us. In Christ's name, we ask all these things. Amen. So before we get to 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, I've, I've got an extended introduction. Make sure you've got your Bible open there, and we'll get there in just a minute. But listen to the word of the Lord from Titus, 1 Timothy, and from the book of Proverbs. Titus 1, 8 and 9. An overseer, as God's steward, must be disciplined. An overseer, as God's steward, must be disciplined. There is nothing special about the character that is required of an overseer, a pastor, an elder of the church. There's no higher bar, really, that is set for an elder pastor overseer. It is just that they must be godly men. And so, in the qualifications of overseers in 1 Timothy 3 and in Titus 1, Paul is just listing, this is what it looks like to be a godly man. And so, Timothy, you can't ever appoint someone to be an elder or an overseer unless he meets these things because he's got to be a godly guy. And one of the things that's mentioned in Titus is that he must be a disciplined man. In 1 Timothy 4.7, Paul writes to Timothy, Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Train yourself. Be disciplined. And now listen to Proverbs 5.22 and 23. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. That's verse 22. Listen to it again. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, trap him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. Verse 23 in Proverbs 5 says, He dies for a lack of discipline. He dies for a lack of discipline. And because of his great folly, he is led astray. Men, you need to know, first of all, that the Christian life is one of discipline. 
The Christian life is one of discipline. A Puritan Peter Vink said, Whatsoever grace you would have strong and lively in the soul, and by grace he means a gift, not saving sovereign grace of justification, but he's talking about a gift. Whatever grace you would have strong and lively in the soul, let it be conscientiously and frequently exercised, and it will become so. This has many a proof amongst the children of God. You want to be strong in the faith? You must be disciplined. Let it be conscientiously and frequently exercised, and it will be so. If I were to peg one thing that I see in immature Christians, one main thing that I see in immature Christians, and especially in males, it is this, a lack of discipline. I don't read my Bible as much as I should. Almost everyone, I hear people say that all the time. I don't read my Bible as much as I should. And I want to say, why? Do you have unrealistic expectations that with your vocation and with your family and with all your other duties that you're going to read the Bible 10 hours every day? Or are you really not devoted to reading and feasting on the Scriptures in private, family, and in public worship? I don't read the Bible as much as I should. Why? Change it. You can read the Bible, but I don't pray as much as I should. Why? And it's, it all comes back down to a lack of discipline. Spiritual habits take personal discipline to form and to maintain. You and I must be as disciplined to spiritually eat the Scriptures as we are to physically eat. We must be as disciplined to spiritually eat as we are to physically eat. We must be as disciplined to spiritually clothe ourselves with good works that have been set before us, that have been prepared beforehand that we should walk in them as we are to physically clothe ourselves. Do you walk out of the house naked? No, you're disciplined enough to put physical clothes on. And I'm saying we have to be that disciplined when it comes to clothing ourselves with the good works that God has saved us and set before us to walk in. You and I must also be as disciplined to meet the needs of others as we are to meet our own needs. As men go, so goes the home. As men go, so goes the home. As men go, so goes the church. Because the men are the leaders in the church. And as men go in general, so goes society. Because men are leaders in society as well. You see a weak society, you can peg weak men for it. As men go, so goes the home, so goes the church, so goes society. And we need men to be men who actually act like men, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16. We need men who are disciplined. Boys, young boys, look at me. And young men, look at me. How the dad goes, that's how the home goes. If the home is not good, you can almost always go back to dad. If the church is unhealthy, and the Christians that are a part of a church are unhealthy, you can go to the men. If the men are weak and the men aren't faithful to Jesus, the church will be weak and won't be faithful to Jesus. If you look out in our society, men, and crazy things are happening, it's because we have weak men who are not doing their duty, and I think a lot of it just comes back to a lack of discipline. If you are not disciplined, here's how I'll put these stark things before we get into the text. If you're not disciplined like God has commanded you to be in Scripture, God will not be glorified as much as He deserves to be through you. If you're not disciplined, God will not be glorified through you as He deserves you will not be as happy as you ought to be if you're not disciplined. Your family will not be as holy as it should be unless you are disciplined. Society will not be as just as it could be if you're not disciplined. And you will waste your days if you're not disciplined. And wasted days lead to a wasted life. But if you are disciplined like God has commanded you to be, God will be glorified through you 
you will be happy in Christ. Your family will be holy and happy. Society will be more just than it would have been if you weren't. And you will not waste your life. So what does this discipline look like now should be the question. What does it look like in the Christian life? And God gives us the answer right here in these four verses in 1 Corinthians 9. This is what godly, Christian, manly discipline looks like. Paul gives us his example which we should follow. As he's going to say later in 1 Corinthians 11, follow me as I follow Christ. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. And so the doctrine, the summary of everything in these four verses is this. This is the doctrine we learned from this passage. If you're going to be disciplined as God has commanded in Scripture, your life will look like a grueling race. An intense athletic training. It'll look like a focused race. Your life will look like a boxing match. And fifthly, your life will look like slave driving. Slave driving yourself, not other people. If you are going to be disciplined as God has commanded in Scripture, your life will look like a grueling race, intense athletic training, a focused race, a boxing match, and slave driving. There's six points to be made in this text, and I think each of them will help us understand what the Christian life what the Christian life looks like, and what the disciplined life looks like. I'll move through some of them quicker than the others because I want to really camp out in the I buffet my body and make it my slave. I think we need to camp there more than anything, but I want to point you to everything in this text. So first look with me at verse 24 in 1 Corinthians 9. And here's the point that you should learn here. If you are going to be disciplined, you must strive hard. Exerting yourself. It's hard work. You must strive hard exerting yourself. Look at verse 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it or that you may win it. Look at it again. Do you not know that in a race... All the runners, the next word is run. That verb literally means to exert yourself, to exhaust yourself, to strive hard. And he's bringing up the metaphor of running a grueling race. And he's saying that's what it looks like to be a disciplined man. Your life is going to feel like you're sprinting. Your life is going to feel like a disciplined, hard, striving, exerting race. Boys and young men, the Christian life, when you follow Jesus and seek to glorify Him, obey Him, and tell other people about Him, your life should feel like you are running a race and you're constantly tired. That's what the Christian life is like. The disciplined Christian life will look like a grueling race. Boys, when was the last time you raced some of your friends? Can you think of that? You sprinted ahead to try to win the race. That's what Paul says the Christian life is like. I am running, and I'm running as hard as I can and as fast as I can. That's what the Christian life looks like. Striving hard, exerting yourself. Thomas Watson said, The truth that the Christian life is compared to a race reproves those who instead of running the race of God's commandments spend all their time in joviality and mirth. What he means is it reproves those that Paul says it's like a race. It rebukes or reproves those who spend all of their time just doing entertaining things or just doing things that make their flesh happy. This is what I want to do. This is what I want to do. He says, look at how Paul says, do you not know that in a race all the runners exert themselves, all of them strive hard, but one receives the prize. So, therefore... Run that you may obtain it, that you may win it. The good thing about the Christian life is that there's not only one winner, that we all get to win in Christ. He says they spend all their time in joviality and mirth, just doing things that make their flesh happy, as if their life were rather a dance than a race. 
It reproves those who spend all of their time in joviality and mirth, acting like their life is a dance rather than a grueling race. Watson again says, Take heed of those things which will hinder you in your race. Shake off sloth. Idleness is the pulse of the devil. The sluggish Christian will never win the race. He is sleeping when he should be running. Sloth is the rust of the soul. So I ask you men to just think and to examine yourselves. Does your life look like and feel like a grueling race? wherein you are exerting yourself, you are striving hard? Or does your life look more like a dance? Do you know anything of the exertion by which George Whitfield ran his race? Some weeks George Whitfield would preach more than he slept. Why? He said, I've got one life to glorify and enjoy God. I will rest, I will have joviality and mirth in heaven with Christ. I've got one life, it's day, and so we're going to make hay while the sun is shining. Some weeks, preaching more than sleeping, and when he was told to slow down, he just quipped, I would rather wear out than rust out. When John Calvin was told to slow down and say, you're being too intense with your schedule, you're exerting yourself too much, Calvin would say, would you have my Lord find me idle and not laboring, striving for His glory? Well, men, I ask you to think to yourself, do you know anything of the kind of exertion that is laid out here in verse 24? That's what discipline looks like. Second, look at verse 25. He uses metaphors throughout the whole passage, which I think is incredibly helpful for me. I think it would be helpful for you as well. And this is the point you should learn from verse 25. If you're going to be disciplined, you must be intentionally self-controlled. Intentionally self-controlled. Self-control does not just come naturally. It's intentional. Look at verse 25. Read it in your own Bible. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Every athlete exercises self-control. It's not every athlete has self-control. It's every athlete exercises self-control. It's a verb. It's an action. It's intentionality. And so if you want to be disciplined, you have to exercise self-control. Boys, and young men especially. The Christian life looks like intense athletic training. Boys, have you ever watched basketball on TV or football on TV? You ever seen that? Have you ever watched the Olympics? Some of you might not even be old enough to have remembered when the Olympics was last on. But I know some of you older men and you young men, you've seen that. Have you ever admired the way that men have their bodies in such control. I admire it all the time. I'm watching the NBA Finals right now, and I see these guys just running around and running around and running around, and they just don't stop, and they do it all game. How do they do that? I, I think back to when I played basketball, and I think I could shoot all right. I could do a few things okay, but I was never in good shape, and so I would run out of energy very quickly and have to come out and tap Ryan to come in for me because I just wasn't in good shape. But I look at these guys that are in such great shape. How are they in that great of shape? How's LeBron like 37 and still in immaculate shape? Because he intentionally disciplines his body. He controls what he eats, what he drinks, his exercise. He has intense athletic training so that he can play the game that he plays. That's what your Christian life should look like. You should outshine LeBron James in your discipline in your life, not so that you can play basketball, but so that you can glorify the Lord and enjoy Him. That's what the Christian life looks like. That's what Paul says next. Self-control. Men, a disciplined man is not led about by his body. 
He does not let his body determine what he does. If he's sick, he goes to work. Unless he physically cannot possibly do it. When you're run down and you're tired, you go to work and you still lead your family in family worship. You do not let your body determine what you do. Disciplined men don't do that. A disciplined man is led by his mind, not by what his body wants, not by what he thinks his body needs. A disciplined man is led by, I know this is what I've got to do, and I'm going to make my body do it. I'm going to go do it unless I just physically cannot. The mind of Christ is had by Christians who have the spirit of Christ. And so the mind of Christ controls us. The body of our flesh does not control us. The body and its weaknesses do not get to to decide what the godly man does. It is never enough to just say, I just can't. I I just, unless you actually physically cannot, then you can keep yourself from a duty. But you're gonna have to do your duties through sickness through weakness, through being tired, through just not feeling great. You're going to have to do that. A godly man does not allow his body to dictate what he does. His mind dictates what he does. That means Christ decides what you do. Like an athlete preparing for a great contest, the spiritually mature man in Christ is laboring even when his flesh would rather be at leisure. It's not fun to work out. And if you get a rush, when you get that rush, when you're actually exercising, some of you know that more than I do because you physically exercise a lot more than I do. That feels good. But most of the time, exercising doesn't really feel great. It feels great after you've exercised. Usually not before or in the middle of it. It's painful, but that's what the Christian life looks like too. Sometimes you don't feel like doing your duty and you do it anyway, and joy comes after you obey, not always before. A godly man labors when he would rather be at leisure. A godly man is fasting when his body would rather be feasting. He's zealous for Christ Jesus and wide awake when his body would like to be fast asleep. If you're going to be disciplined, you must be intentionally self-controlled, And the mind of Christ, as revealed in the Scriptures, and that you've been given by the Holy Spirit, the mind of Christ controls what you do, not your body. So I just ask you to think, what or who decides what you do? Is it your body? Is it your belly, meaning your lusts, your sinful desires and appetites? Or is it your mind, which is fixed on Christ? It must be your mind. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, something that will be thrown away that won't last. We do it to go to heaven and enjoy Christ forever and glorify Him in this one life He's given. If athletes can so train and exercise self-control for something that will be thrown in the trash one day, then we can do it for Christ. The third thing that we learn is in the first part of verse 26. And the truth that we learn here is that if you're going to be disciplined, you must not run uncertainly or aimlessly. You must not run uncertainly or aimlessly. Look at the beginning of verse 26. So I do not run aimlessly or uncertainly. I do not run not in a way that you would say, this guy doesn't even know where he's going. Saying, I've got my eyes fixed exactly where I'm going. Where I'm going. I've got a plan every day. I've got a plan every week. I've got a plan every month. I've got a plan every year. And I am chasing after Christ and His glory. I know where I'm running. I'm not running aimlessly. That's what he says next. He says about himself, I do not run uncertainly or aimlessly boys and young men the christian life looks like a race that is being run and the guy that's running the race knows where he's going he knows where he's going he knows where the finish line is he's focused on where he's running imagine boys and young men that you're 
about to run a race with other people and you see where the finish line is. And as soon as you start the race, a few of the other boys start running this way and that way and that way. Or they run straight a little bit and then they swerve over here and then they swerve back. Are they going to win? If they run the wrong way, you're going to go, the, the finish line's there. Run that way. Run straight. That's what Paul is saying the Christian life is. You know where you're running. You know what you're doing. You know what the scripture says your duties are. And you're doing the best that you can to keep your eyes fixed. And you, no one would ever say, he's running aimlessly. Or he, he doesn't even know what he's trying to do in his life. If you're going to be disciplined, you, not, you must not run uncertainly or aimlessly. So I ask you, where are you running? You see the metaphor for the Christian life? I know, where, I know what my duties are. I know what God has said in His Word. And I, from the light He's given me, I know what the goal of life is. I know what the duties are that I need to do every day and every week and month and year. I know what the end game is, what the end goal is. What is the finish line? Are you aiming at that? Or would somebody look at your life metaphorically and just be like, you're running like this. You're just going all over the place and they'd say, you are running aimlessly. You're not sprinting at the prize. So where are you running why are you running there? Some of you may be laser focused on the finish line that you're running at. And you maybe need to examine that and make sure, is that the finish line I should be running for? Is, is this job or career or family or whatever it may be, fill in the blank in your own situation. But is that where I should be running? So some of the problem with men is that they're, they're not running at all in a straight line. They're running aimlessly. But with other men, they're not really running aimlessly as like they're running in a straight line. But if Christ and his glory and obeying him is there, like they're running in a straight line, but they're running there. So examine yourself. Where are you running? Are you running straight? And are you running in the way that God has revealed in his scriptures that you should run? Men, you exist to glorify God and you Every one of you individually have been given specific gifts and talents that you are to use within the body of Christ and in society to build up the church and to make this world a better place than it was. You are salt and light. In society, you are salt and light in the church. And there's only one you. God has designed you, gifted you, given you talents and abilities that other people in your church especially do not have. So figure out, if you don't know what those are, figure those out. Ask your community group or your small group. Ask your pastors and aim where you should aim. Paul says, I do not run aimlessly. But then look, fourthly, at what we learn, the next part of verse 26. After that semicolon. I do not run aimlessly. Then he says, I do not box as one beating the air. I do not box. That word, it literally means to fight with the fists. He, he is using what, what you think of when we talk about heavyweight or lightweight boxing, a boxing match, match, to fight with the fists. And do you see the metaphor? He's saying the Christian life is like a boxing match. I'm switching metaphors, he's saying. And... I am not someone who's just always shadow boxing. I'm not someone who's just always practicing. I'm not sitting around just always hitting nothing, saying I'm a boxer who strikes blows on the enemy. I don't just practice the Christian life or theorize about the Christian life and know all of this good doctrine and know what the Christian life should look like and all of that. And he's saying, I actually hit something. I'm not a boxer who just practices. I'm not beating the air. That word beating means thrashing or flaying or smiting. It's the same exact word that's used in the gospel accounts for when they beat Jesus before his crucifixion. It's a brutal beating. He's saying, I am striking blows on the enemy. I'm striking blows on my sin. I'm striking blows at doing my duties. I'm actually hitting something, not just 
thinking about what the Christian life looks like. So boys and young men, Paul says the Christian life looks like a boxer who is not just always punching the air. That doesn't really do anything, does it? If a boxer only ever punches the air, you'd say, I don't know if he's a good boxer or not. He's good at punching nothing. But a good boxer is someone who gets in the ring fighting another man and he can land a blow. He can punch them. He says that's what the Christian life looks like. Not someone just beating the air. And so I ask you to think, are you shadow boxing? Are you just beating the air in the Christian life? You know a lot of doctrine. You could pass systematic theology tests. You know what a godly man should look like. You know what the Christian life should look like. You even know what it looks like to be disciplined. But all that is is just beating the air. You're not actually ever striking the blows. Are you always debating people about tertiary issues? Always trying to pick a theological debate? Are you listening to podcasts all of the time about interesting things? rather than doing your duties. Do you play at godliness? You know what godliness looks like, but you're not exerting yourself. You're boxing the air. You know the theories of healthy doctrine and a life that comes from it, but you don't know any of its power? Is that you? Then you're doing the opposite of what Paul says he's doing. You're doing the opposite of being disciplined if that's you. He says, I do not box as one beating the air. And then fifthly, look. If you're going to be disciplined, you must buffet your body and make it your slave. That's a better translation than the ESV. I discipline my body. Let me just tell you what that word that's translated discipline, what that word literally means in the Greek. It means to give intolerable annoyance like a boxer punching himself. It means to smite something so as to cause bruises. That's what that word that's translated discipline in the English Standard Version. It means you're punching someone or something so much that it's bruising them. Discipline might not be a great word. And he doesn't say, I'm beating up, I'm pummeling, I'm buffeting. It means literally to beat black and blue. He said, I'm not doing that to other people. I'm doing it to myself. Do you see? I discipline or buffet, strike blows on what? My body. And keep it under control. It literally comes from doulos, which means slave. It's not just keeping it under control. It's, as the old translations put it, I pummel my body into submission and I make my body my slave. So if you're going to be disciplined, that's what it looks like. It looks like slave driving yourself. When you get out of line, you're beating yourself into submission. It doesn't mean that you should actually physically strike blows on yourself. It doesn't mean what asceticism means. It doesn't mean that you're always beating yourself up when you sin, because all that is is pride and self-pity. When you won't confess it, repent of it, and look to Christ in faith. He's not talking about being hard on yourself like people say. He's talking about what Thomas Watson calls in his book, Heaven Taken by Storm. He says what Paul is meaning is it's offering holy violence to yourself. Offering holy violence to yourself. One of the most transformative books that I have ever read in my life is this book. Heaven Taken by Storm by Thomas Watson. This is the best book that has ever been written on discipline and how we must use the ordinary means of grace that God has given us to grow and glorify God. Heaven taken by storm. This is the original printing of it in America. They they brought it to America in 1810 and they retitled it The Christian Soldier. And the whole point in the book is he takes that passage in Matthew that says, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. That passage means people are pushing themselves into the kingdom of God by holy violence. They are striving. They are disciplined. They're moving forward. You can read 
commentaries today and even study Bibles, and most all of them get it wrong because men are so effeminate these days, and they don't like passages like that. R.C. Sproul nails it, gets it right. Because the cross-reference for, for that same type thing that Jesus says in another gospel account shows that it's not just talking about persecution that comes. The kingdom of heaven suffers violence. So some will say, well, that's about persecution that's coming. No, 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 no. It's about doing violence to get to heaven in a spiritual sense, not in a physical sense. But this is what Thomas Watson calls offering holy violence to yourself in that short must-read book, Heaven Taken by Storm. And he outlines different ways that we offer holy violence to ourselves to buffet our bodies and make our bodies our slaves. And I want to commend these to you. This is where we'll finish and where we'll spend a little bit more time. If you're going to be disciplined, you must buffet your body and make it your slave. So how do we do that? How do you offer holy violence to yourself? First, if you are going to say with Paul, I buffet my body and make it my slave, then you must mortify your sins. You must be killing sin. Or as John Owen said, sin will be killing you. That's what it looks like to make your body your slave. First of all, you have to mortify your sin. Ground this truth in Colossians 3, 5, where Paul says, Put to death what is earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. You must mortify. You must be killing your sin. Keeping watch for your sin. And when temptations arise or when you give in, putting it to death. Cutting it off by repentance and looking to Christ in faith. Never making peace. Why does Paul say, put to death, or the old translation said, mortify. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Mortify what is earthly in you. Because he knew what Peter knew in 1 Peter 2.11, where he says, I urge you, abstain from the passions of the flesh, which what? What do they do? Any of you remember? They wage war against your soul. So you must mortify. That's the first main point under this point that you have to mortify your sin if you're going to buffet your body. But secondly, you must continually mortify. Not just mortify. You have to continually mortify. Galatians 5.24 Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That word, they've crucified the flesh, is in the active, which means those, uh, we should say it like this, those who belong to Christ Jesus are continually crucifying the flesh. It's an active thing. It keeps going. It's not we do it once. It's sin rears its ugly head, and we have to lop its head off. Temptation comes up and we put it to death by the Spirit with the sword of the Spirit. When we fall into sin, we stand up, confess our sin to the Lord, praise God that Christ is our propitiation, and we break off our sins by repentance, turning from it. You must continually mortify. Would you say that in your mortification and in your seeking to put your sin to death that you would say, I am crucifying the flesh along with its passions and desires? That's what Paul says Christians do. If you're going to be disciplined, you have to continually mortify. You must also, thirdly, viciously mortify. Viciously mortify. This is what Christ means when He says in Matthew 5, 29-30, if your right eye causes you to sin, put a patch over it so you can't see anymore. You know he doesn't say that. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That's vicious mortification of sin. Give no quarter to your sins. Revenge the death of Christ on your lusts. As Thomas Boston said, you have to mortify continually and viciously. 
Watson says, in order to viciously mortify, he says, withdraw the fuel that may make lust burn. Avoid all temptations. Take heed of that which nourishes sin. He who would suppress the gout or kidney stone avoids those meats which are noxious. Those who pray that they may not be led into temptation must not lead themselves into temptation. You must viciously mortify. So men, apply that passage to your life in seeking to mortify your sin. What do you need to do to tear your eye out or cut your hand off? That means examining yourself. What are the things in my life that I frequently find myself being tempted to sin? Are there any patterns in my life? Are there, is it my cell phone? Is it my computer? Is it when I don't get enough sleep and I respond in anger? Or is it I don't spend enough time in the Word early in the day and so I'm not feasting on it and I can just tell that leads me to just fall into temptation easier. Whatever it may be that you need to change, that's what vicious mortification of the flesh looks like. That's what tearing your eye out looks like. It's you do whatever is necessary to make sure that when you pray the Lord's Prayer, lead us not into temptation. You don't say amen, and then you go lead yourself into temptation. So vicious mortification is necessary. But fourth, you must spiritually mortify. Spiritually mortify. That is, with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and by the power of God the Holy Spirit. You cannot mortify without the Spirit energizing and strengthening you, and you cannot mortify the flesh without using the sword of the Spirit. We have been given armor, and we have one offensive weapon. It is the Scriptures. You need to study Christ's temptation in the wilderness and see how does Christ kill temptations. He does it every time with the sword of the Spirit. He does it with the Scriptures. John Piper, years ago, created this website, and then they created it into an app that I don't even know if it's still functioning, but it's to help people in their church, in Bethlehem Baptist Church, where I used to pastor, help them fight for godliness. And they had verses every day to memorize, and they called them their fighter verses. You need fighter verses. Verses. You need to have passages of Scripture or even verses memorized so that even when temptation comes, you're putting to death that temptation with the sword of the Spirit. I remember when Piper was even talking about this maybe a decade ago, and I'm trying to fight against the lusts of the flesh, sexual immorality and temptation to look on women lustfully. I'm trying to fight that, and I remember Piper specifically, I can still hear it. He said, you need to memorize and use blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. When you give in to sexual temptation, you're putting a cloud in between you and Christ. And so you're not going to be seeing his loving smile. You're not going to be feeling the joy of communion with Christ. And so he said that and it just clicked with me. I get it. Fighter verses. Get it. We've got verses we've memorized so that when we're tempted, we're pulling out that sword and cut the head off the snake. Viciously mortify, spiritually mortify with the sword of the Spirit. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it means you're depending on the Spirit. You're asking Him to strengthen you. That's what Paul means in Romans 8.13 when he says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. You can't do it. You need the Spirit to strengthen you and you need to use the sword that He has sharpened and given to you. Spiritually mortify. Lastly, fifthly, concerning mortification, you must mindfully mortify by what's happening in your mind. Mindfully mortify. That is, with the eyes of your mind, the eyes of your heart fixed on Christ Jesus. 
The reason I say mindfully mortify, because your frame of mind, what you're thinking about, what you're filling your mind with, is imperative when it comes to mortifying the deeds of the flesh. This is something that, if you've been around me long, you've probably heard me make this connection many times, and I'll just keep doing it. Colossians 3, 1 through 5. 1 through 4 is all about getting your eyes fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ. His promises, His glories. Get your eyes up to Christ. Fix your eyes on Christ. And then verse 5 is put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. It's fix your eyes on the Lord Jesus. And that's the only way that you're really, when you're tempted or when you do fall into sin, that's the only way you're going to mortify. Just listen to the flow of this in Colossians 3, 1 through 5. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Isn't that great? Focus on Jesus. He's coming back for you. When He appears, you'll appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death what is earthly in you. It's in your minds being focused on Christ that you're actually going to be able to mortify because continually focusing on Jesus will make sin look bitter, more bitter, and more bitter. When you see how sweet Christ is, you will be energized and strengthened by the Spirit to actually mortify you have to mortify. That's how you buffet your body and make it your slave. Continually, viciously, spiritually, mindfully. Now, secondly, when it comes to buffeting your body and making, your, making it your slave, you need not only to mortify the flesh, but you have to devote yourself to spiritual duties. You have to devote yourself to the ordinary means of grace that God has given you and I and that we have to put into use. That's why I say that this is the best book ever written on that because he just goes through all of these ways. Everything, all of these seven that I'm going to point you to right here, this is the outline in that portion of Thomas Watson's book, Heaven Taken by Storm. These are the things that he says how to be disciplined, how to, how to take the kingdom of heaven by holy violence. First, you must buffet your body by reading the word. Buffet your body by reading the word. Psalm 119.5 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my, fat, my path. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. How are you even going to know where you should walk if you never pick up the lamp? So you have to buffet your body by reading the Word and being disciplined in that. Second, you must make your body your slave by listening to the Word being preached. You ask a Puritan, if you had one hour, would you rather read the Bible on your own or listen to a sermon? And they would say, what a stupid question. Of course I would rather listen to a sermon. Are you kidding me? I get to listen to somebody who's been preparing for 20 hours and is not going to let me wiggle free. They're going to apply it to me. They're going to apply it to me in a happy way to help me see Christ probably better than I'm going to do. They're going to apply it to me in a more vicious way that I'm going to try to avoid in my flesh. They would say, listening to a sermon is way better than reading the Bible on your own. Because you're doing both. You're listening and reading at the same time. So that's the second way that Watson even mentions that you must make your body your slave by listening to the Word, by hearing the Word preached. Man, we have such good opportunities to do this. Monergism.com Sermonaudio.com If you don't know some faithful Bible teachers to listen to and how to like redeem your drive times or whatever that you've got when you're working out, when you're doing yard work, Listen to sermons. Podcasts can be okay, but only if they're going to the Scriptures. 
If it's just entertaining, use that time to be listening to the preaching of the Word. In Luke 19.48, all the people were hanging on Christ's words. They were hanging on His every word. They see Him in the flesh and hear Him preach, and they didn't want to miss one word. But we have something better. We have something better than hearing the audible voice of one of the members of the Godhead. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. That's what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. So listen to it being preached. Third, you must buffet your body by prayer. Buffet your body by prayer and by devoting yourself to prayer. Psalm 88, 1. O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out day and night before you. Let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry. You need to have time set aside to pray privately. Just you. Pray with your family and family worship. To pray in the assembly of the saints. To pray with brothers in fellowship. Buffet your body by prayer, by hearing the word, by reading the word. And fourthly, he says, you must make your body your slave by meditating on the word. Meditating on it. That means in your time of private worship, you're getting in a quiet place, you've read the scriptures, you've prayed, and then you're just going to sit there and think. You're going to think about the truths of God. Sinclair Ferguson said, if you put the average Christian in the, in the West alone in a room and said, I just want you to meditate on the person of Christ for 10 minutes. He said most of them would be bored after two because they don't know enough of Christ to fill their minds with for 10 minutes. It must not be so with us. Meditation is a lost art. It's something that all throughout the scriptures, it's there. It's something that's expected of us. It's a spiritual discipline, and it's a means of grace to think on, just think about the truths that God has revealed in the Scriptures. Psalm 119.97 Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation day and night. Make your body your slave by meditating on the Word. Watson gives six Six things to meditate on. Just quickly, he says, well, meditate seriously upon the corruption of your nature. How sinful you are outside of Christ. Think about that. That'll humble you and you'll be thankful for Jesus. He says, secondly, meditate seriously on the death and passion of Christ. Just sit and think about what Christ went through to redeem you. Third, Watson says, meditate on your evidences for heaven. That God has brought me to faith. I'm different than I used to be. God has made me alive in Christ. I'm going to go be with Jesus one day. Fourth, upon the uncertainty of all earthly comforts. So just think about the fact that everything you own, everything that's going on in your life, will either be taken from you now or later like that. All earthly comforts, all the things that we think if we lose them or if we don't get them, life won't be worth anything. It says, meditate on the uncertainty of all earthly comforts. Fifth, meditate on God's severity against sin. Let's just think about how severe God is against sin and punishing sin. That'll help you hate sin all the more. He says, sixth, meditate on eternal life. Just think about that you will be with Christ forever. And this life is a vapor. Meditate on eternal life with Jesus. No more sickness. No more sin. No more sadness. You'll be with Him and like Him. I would just add two. The seventh, I, I would add, meditate seriously on the law of God and the promises of God. Meditate on the Ten Commandments. Meditate on all the, all the promises that you can draw to your mind. Maybe you just have a few right now, but you know, you know Romans 8.28, don't you? Sit alone and meditate on that, that God has promised to work all things together for good, for those who love Him and are called according to His purpose. Meditate on Romans 8, 1, that promise. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Meditate on the law of God, the promises of God, and then I would just add to that, 
as well. Meditate on the attributes of God. Just sit and, and think about His omniscience. Think about His omnipotence. Think about His holiness. Think about His justice. Make your body your slave by meditating. Fifth, you must buffet your body by self-examination. Examining yourself. 1 Corinthians 11.28 God requires that we do that before we even take the Lord's Supper. To examine yourself. Set up a court of conscience and like Watson says, take apart yourself like a watchmaker would take apart a watch and put all the pieces out in front of them. He says, do that to yourself. Take yourself apart and just examine yourself. See if there be any evil way in you. Sixth, you must make your body your slave by sanctifying the Lord's day. This is Watson, and he's right. Sanctifying, setting apart the Lord's day, not only for worship and physical rest, but also for worshiping the Lord, whether it be privately or with your family, the rest of the day. The Lord's day is a delight that has been given to you and me to worship Him and rest in Him all the day. Sanctify the Lord's day. And that's one of the ways you've got to buffet your body. Maybe some of you don't sanctify the Lord's day already because of a lack of discipline. Like, well, if I do that, then I can't... Well, that's when I mow. Or that's when I run my errands. Or that's when, you know, fill in the blank. It's like, are you not... Can you not be disciplined enough to get that done on the other days? so that you can sanctify the day that the Lord has said to set aside? Sanctify the Lord's day. Seventh, you must buffet your body by holy fellowship and conversation. A holy fellowship with other believers. Intentionally fellowshipping with brothers and sisters in Christ. Just think again about Psalm 1-1. I know you know of it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And the inverse of that is, blessed is the man who stands in the same way as the righteous, who walks in the way of the righteous, who is in the counsel of the righteous, who sits with the righteous. Buffet your body by intentional holy fellowship now sixth, look, look in, back in 1 Corinthians 9 at the last part of verse 27 where he says, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is what you should grab. You need to teach this to others and you must Practice what you preach. It can't be theory. But you need to tell this to other people. People need to hear that the wicked perish for a lack of discipline. You and I must preach this to others and we must practice what we preach. Lest we preach the truth of Christ and then disqualify ourselves. Boys and young men, the Christian life is not just about talking. It's not just about talking. The Christian life is also about acting, about doing. We don't just talk about Jesus. We are to live for Him. We don't just talk about worshiping Him. We actually worship Him. The Christian life is not about talking. It's about doing. And so in conclusion, I just remind you again of Proverbs 5, 22 and 23. The iniquities of the wicked ensnare him, and he is held fast in the cords of his sin. He dies for a lack of discipline, and because of his great folly, he is led astray. Now may God give you and I the grace to be godly, disciplined men who say with Paul, I buffet my body and make it my slave. You'll be happy in Him. Your family will be loved. Christ will be glorified. So let's buffet our bodies and make them our slaves. Pray with me. 
Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We ask you simply to help us to be disciplined men in mortifying and in devoting ourselves to holy duties that you've given us and help us never to depend on our own strength but to strengthen ourselves in the Lord and in the strength of his might. We ask you for repentance to grant each of us in whatever ways we each individually need to repent. Help us to repent to break off our sins by repentance. Strengthen us to joyfully buffet our bodies and make them our slaves. Help us to do that with joy, knowing that you are worth it. That this one life is worth it to live for your glory. That our families are worth it to be disciplined. That the world... Our neighbors are worth it to be disciplined so that we can love them and serve them. And our children are worth it. So help us to march forward in joy. We ask you that you equip us to act like men. Train us up as we look at your scriptures the next 10 Mondays together so that we can be trained up and we can glorify you and enjoy you. That's what we ask in Christ's name. Amen.